How are you doing? I'm good, Adam. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Good. Um, we have sushi. We do have sushi. I just got in from a trip, so I didn't cook. Next time you come to my house, I'll cook. I promise. That's a deal. I'll make you some Italian food. <laughs> what, uh, what did you end up getting? I just got plain tuna, just tuna sashimi. It's a treat, so I just thought this is a special occasion, so I would have some tuna with you. Do you actually know how to use those? I sure do. I am terrible. Okay, you can try. So, um, I'm, I'm not going to teach you how to use them, I'm just gonna, <laughs> because I'm sure someone will tell me that I'm wrong, but I just kind of hold them up here, and then uh, you use the top to make this move, and kind of just like, kind of like that. You know, I think there was one, one point where I was like getting the hang of it, and then I just went a long time without trying it, so let me try. Let me... And you have some soy sauce. There, you got it. Oh, See? Look at you. We you got it. You said you weren't going to be able to teach me that. <laughs> When the kids were little, and I would take them for sushi, um, I would give them chopsticks, and a lot of times you go to a sushi restaurant, they'll put like a rubber band on the top, mm -hmm. and they use the, the cover for the chopsticks to make it so that there's like a little lever so the kids can use them, and I would take uh, pieces of uh, straw uh, paper, you know, the straw cover, right. and I'd roll them into balls, and we'd have a game like so they could practice using the chopsticks. But you can use a fork if you want to use a fork. I don't no, you know what? <laughs> taking the challenge. You got it. You got try. it. There you go. But please have some of mine if you'd like to try some. I got enough tuna. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So thanks for coming to my house. No, I appreciate you inviting me. Um, it's the first time I've really been in like, actually, to be honest with you, I've only been into like certain spots of Florida. Okay. Very, very seldom. It was the first time I really got to like drive through Florida. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, like tomorrow I'm going to Miami for the first time. Okay. Um, like when I was a kid, I, you know, I did the typical Disney yeah, yeah, yeah. experience. Disney is not my favorite part of Florida for a number of reasons, as you can <laughs> imagine. But um, no, I agree. You know, most people come to Florida or they think about Florida as Disney World. I mean, it's so much more than that. It's really a beautiful place and um, we have so much wildlife and we're on the water. And a lot of people in Florida are very concerned about the environment mm -hmm. and conservation. And I think that's something that, you know, kind of gets missed when we talk about Florida because there's a lot of conservation efforts to make sure that we keep our water clean and we take care of our natural surroundings. So, Right. Like that's, a, <laughs> I had, to, uh, had the, the reminder yesterday when I got in, I was like, oh yeah, there are like little lizards that run around. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah, there are. And not just little ones anymore because people have like iguanas and stuff now. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you'll see like bigger lizards but apparently the iguanas uh, my kids have told me when it, it gets cold they can't come too far north in mm. florida and when it gets cold they actually freeze and they stop um they they can't i guess they kind of they become unconscious they like fall out of trees if it gets too cold they just their bodies can't continue to operate and so they'll fall out of a tree and then it gets warm again and they <laughs> get up and keep moving they go through that but whole they process. get really big I mean, that's something we definitely don't have in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have the same traffic as New Jersey either, I think. So that's good. You know, yeah. it's funny you mentioned that because everybody says like, oh, insert place. We have a lot of traffic. I'm like, and I go there and you guys aren't. Traffic. New Jersey. New yeah. Jersey traffic. Yeah. It's pretty intense. It's not as bad as people think. New okay. York traffic. New York traffic is like. New York is the only place that I've been in traffic at four in the morning. That's crazy. Yeah. So my family's all from New York. That's mm -hmm. where I was born. I was about to ask you, have you always lived in Florida? Mm -mm. No, I was born in New York. My dad was from Brooklyn. My mom was Long Island. Okay. Um, and then we moved here when I was eight. Okay. I feel like Florida is like the pathway for all New Yorkers. <laughs> Probably. My dad was, yeah, it was interesting. He was just, I think, tired of the snow. Um, and there was a lot of crime happening in the area where he had his business. And I think he just was at a, at a time in the mid 80s where he just felt like it was a time to make a change. And so we all moved down here and it was great. Beautiful. I'm, you know, my husband and I love raising our kids in Florida. Yeah. Um, were your parents like stayed together? Yeah, my parents were married. My father's passed away. My mom is still alive, but mm. they were married um, and had four kids. And so uh, it was lovely. Um, you know, uh, 
to, uh, I have two adopted siblings, but like from a very young age from birth. And so just kind of learned about love and how love is, you know, it's thicker than just blood, right? It's right. you choose your family and, um, you know, it's just a great way to grow up and gave me a real appreciation for love and family and siblings and all of what that means. So my siblings and I are still really close. Wow. I mean, to me, that makes sense as to why you're so passionate about what you're doing now with Moms for Liberty, you know. I think you have to care. Like, yeah, you, you there have was to. no question when I was growing <laughs> yeah. up that my parents were in charge. Yeah, like there was just no question. The idea that parents wouldn't be in charge of their kids' education or someone would know better than them for better than you as a dad for your son, mm -hmm. I just just doesn't even make sense to me. Right. You know. So, I mean, I I always felt like as a kid, the teachers were like, let's say, subject matter experts. Sure. Right, but they're not like these like beings that are all knowing of everything, and I just never, I never even thought of the term like administration when I was a kid, because it was like the only administrators you really knew were like the vice principal, yeah, or the, the principal. principal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was very small, at yeah. least at least in the schools that I went to. Yeah, hundred percent. But now it seems different. It seems like there's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole bureaucracy that's been built. Yeah. Uh, within the school system that maybe just has been inflated in the, in the past, I don't know, decade or so? I don't know. Joe Biden told the teachers, when they're when the kids are in your classroom, they're your children. <laughs> and I watched that, as many parents across America watched that, and then we were like, I'm sorry, what? He said, no, they're, these are our kids. Right. Right? I mean, we may delegate the uh, the, the authority to, to teach and you know, in some capacity, the, delegate the education part of our children's lives to a teacher to be able to do in the classroom, but you're not delegating your parental rights. You're not de delegating your ultimate responsibilities. Right. And so the idea that someone that sees your child for a certain amount of time during the day has a better, you know, idea of what your child needs as a human being, as a full person, it's just crazy. And American parents, I think, are sitting here going like, wait a second, when did the government, when we have government schools, I don't say that to be like, it's not a slur. It's just the reality of the situation. We have government schools. Mm -hmm. And that means that we need to be very vigilant about what's being taught and, and what the role of the school is in your child's life. And during COVID, when they said parents couldn't come into the schools, even in New York City, the parents still aren't allowed to go to back to school night, mm -hmm. which I just found out that's because of the union bargaining contract, by the <laughs> way. The union actually bargained that the teachers wouldn't have to come in person to back to school night. That was a priority for them. I, I mean, the idea that they would do that, parents are the number one driver of student success. Nothing will make a child more successful in a classroom than an involved parent. Right. So if the ultimate goal of the school system or the teacher is to make sure that the child is successful, then you should be rolling out the red carpet for parents, right? right. Not telling them that they can't come into the classroom. And by the way, how many places in your son's life have you been okay with not with sending your son into and you not going? Nowhere. <laughs> I mean, but I guess I always come back to like, how did we get here? Like, how did we come to this point? Um, you know, I, I think in general uh, that it's been a really slow boil. I think that uh, I know that there was a long march through the institutions and we're truly in like the operational phase of what that looks like. Um, and so we have to be really strategic in how we deal with the people that are doing these types of things because they have been planning and doing this for a long time and it's a really layered effect. But it's a small group of people when you really consider Americans in general. Right. And so I just think that the odds are in our favor, but we have to be really smart about how we engage. I completely agree with that. I think that's one of the things that um, worries me is that I don't even, I don't even want to say like it's a right thing like a, like the political right only yeah i think it, it's just like regular common sense kind of people would generally agree with our stance um and i'm worried that there are people who think that this this is actually the majority the majority of the people believe this but you're right it's always very specific people who who share these particular narratives like we talk about these uh highly progressive colleges and they produce these kids and yep. they introduce all these concepts. 
Well, eventually they're going to go somewhere. Yeah. And where do they go? Well, growing bureaucracy within a public school system, and they go into the media, and they go into all these prominent places that want college graduates who've all had the similar type of education. And eventually these, these young people, I don't want to call them kids, but the, these young people want to save the world one child at a time. Um, and Which is noble. I mean, listen, like, I, I mean, I love teachers. That's the thing I think has been really kind of a mischaracterization of Moms for Liberty. Yeah. Tina and I served as school board members. We've volunteered in classrooms. I mean, I spent four years visiting classrooms every day, talking to teachers, working with principals, trying to understand the way the school district worked, trying to help to reprioritize the budget because the budget, the way you spend your money in your district is really... Um, really shows your values, right? What do you think is important? Well, you fund what's important. And so um, we love teachers, right? Uh, the idea that we don't, I think, is something that the mainstream media and a lot of the people, the teachers union on, wants to kind of, you know, make uh, the, the narrative. But the truth is that, you know, who's keeping parents out of the back to school night? The union, mm -hmm. right? Why does the union not want parents involved? Because, and, I, and I was thinking, Adam, about like the United Auto Workers you, you know, strike. And I was like, okay, they're striking against the man, right? They're striking against these big business automotive manufacturers who are you know, looking to kind of you know, go along with ESG and CEI and all that stuff, right? That are you know, looking at EVs and, and saying, you know, that's going to take a lot of people out of the workforce. But you know, they're, they're being pushed in that direction with, by the Biden administration. Right. And then you have Biden out on the, the strike line with them. And, and the workers, well, it was funny, though, because the, the leadership was all about Biden, but the workers, you could see, were not buying it for a second. And that, to me, was a reflection of how far away this administration and what they're trying to do is from the people. So when I was on school board, I saw that the teachers union bargained for the people at the table, mm -hmm. not the teachers in the classroom. Most of the time, the teachers in the classroom had no idea what the union was bargaining for. I have a friend, Erica Donalds, who tells a story about how there was a school um, that really needed a lot of help. It was kind of on the outskirts of her district. It was hard to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and for most of the teachers, it wasn't like an advantageous place to work, right? You're adding on, you know, maybe like an hour commute onto your day. If you're a mom and you're a teacher, that's hard, right? And, and, and when you would go to this school, it was more rural and the kids were coming at, to school every day with a bit of a deficit, they needed more help and more support. And so she tells this story where she tried to get uh, bonuses for new teachers to come and how the teachers union worked against her and said, and eventually bargained so that it was that everyone got a bonus. And what she wanted to do was give a bonus to come. And then every year you stayed to increase what that bonus was because, right. you know, the longer the teacher was there and the more they could work with the kids and create a new culture in that school, the better off the kids would be. And the union killed it. And I just think it's reflective of, of their position, which is a lot about adults' wants, but not really putting kids first. Um, and it's concerning because it's changing the way American public education is working and it's to the, def it's to the detriment of the kids. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, it reminds me of this, um, I think it was, it wasn't PBS, uh, but it was like a documentary piece that you can find on YouTube and I was watching it. Uh, and it talks about Detroit. And Detroit is uh, where I was born, actually. Oh, okay. And we left when I was like four years old, something like that. Uh, I was pretty young when we left. But Detroit Public Schools, at least in that, in that piece they were talking about, uh, and I think it was from 2010 or maybe 2008, somewhere around there. But they were saying that uh, Detroit Public Schools was the number one employer in the city. Yep. Normally, it's that's the case. Yeah. And... And it was just amazing because I think at that point they were saying like in eight years, they had seven uh, superintendents. Yeah. Oh, the, the Detroit superintendent now came out of Florida. He was in Miami and then he was in, I forget what the other district was before he went to Detroit. His last name is Vidi. Mm -hmm. And he's a big, big CRT, CRT pusher. <laughs> proponent of CRT. Yeah, because that's what Detroit needs, more CRT. <laughs> yeah, but that's interesting. I mean, yes, yeah, seven superintendents in eight years. But at part of that piece, they were following this one superintendent, and basically she was uncovering fraud, and suddenly the school board doesn't like her, and then they started defaming her. And it makes with you her. look bad, I guess, if you're on the school board. I mean, I yeah. don't know. 
It's crazy. Adults covering for adults. Yeah. And what happens? They, they fired her and they looked for another one. I think at that point, the state ended up trying to come in. And then the state uncovered more fraud and actually started prosecuting people. Like it was so, it was so bad that the teachers would have checkbooks and they were just writing checks for all types of stuff. I'd, I'd probably trust the teachers more, <laughs> honestly, well, for what they It was they like personal in the stuff. Classroom. No, it was, well, that's not- yeah, it was, it, was, it was really bad, but there was no oversight. That was the whole problem. It just became one big piggy bank. But they were also following a, a family, and especially one girl who was going from middle school to high school. And she had a decent experience in middle school, made it to high school. And they were following, following her, and you see like how demoralized she was getting as each day went by. Teachers didn't show up. Oh, sorry, we don't have any textbooks yet. And it would be weeks after it's the awful. school start. You know, uh, oh, no, we're just in the, in the lunchroom again. It was like, well, what? They're not learning anything. Yeah. And, and we're wasting years of their life. Like, it's still, I think it's stolen time. It's criminal to me. Yeah. What they're doing because the kids don't get their, that time in their life back. Even with COVID, they shut schools down. If you were a kid in San Francisco, mm-hmm. right, you missed 18 months of school. So if you were uh, supposed to go into kindergarten, you didn't. If you were supposed to go into first grade, you didn't. And then you were old enough to go into second grade, seven, eight years old. So what happened? Did you get to go back to kindergarten? Did they give you the tools? (laughs) Did they give you the tools that you needed to be successful in second grade? Mm -hmm. What about what you learned in kindergarten and first grade? Those are important years. I mean, kindergarten, your first year in school, you're learning how to work with other kids and be in a classroom, right? Right. And then first grade, you're learning how to read. I mean, kindergarten, they really are setting that foundation, right? And you miss two years and then all of a sudden you're in second grade. And then people wonder, like, why are kids not like mentally fit and healthy? Why are they not feeling good? We're asking children to do tasks that we've never given them foundational knowledge to do. Right. And then we wonder why they are depressed, anxious, frustrated, angry, aggressive. I mean, can you imagine if every day when you were going to work, you were being asked to do something that no one had prepared you to do, and then when you didn't do it, you were, what? I mean, now, unfortunately, there aren't even repercussions for you not doing it because the school system so badly wants to be successful. Mm -hmm. Two things that school districts do really well, celebrate themselves and protect themselves. A lot of times they celebrate themselves in order to protect themselves. The school district can't come out and show failure, right? Who's going to vote for the referendum, right? right? So they are going to try to celebrate what they can. A lot of times there are great things to celebrate. There are accomplishments for kids. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, we have to be honest about where we are right now or else we're not going to fix the fact that three in 10, only three in 10 kids in America are reading on grade level. You know, and I showed you earlier some statistics that show it's not just three in 10 kids are reading on grade level, but, you know, five in 10 kids are reading far, far away from where they need to be. So we're talking talking just basic, but we're talking below basic. So they've right. got, you know, two, three, four years to make up. When, when are they going to make that up? And then when you look at graduation rates at 85%, 90%, cause it's fun to celebrate graduation rates. A lot of superintendents will tell you that the best indicator of success of a four year, you want kids graduating in four years, right? And you want to, you look at that benchmark of graduation rate. And so now they figure out how to rig the graduation rate. And so kids get pushed forward. You've got, you know, a quarter of the kids reading proficiently in eighth grade. And then you've got 85, 90% of kids graduating. Does anyone really believe that kids are going from not proficient or far, far below proficient in reading in eighth grade to fully proficient in graduating? No. 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 And and matter of fact, Detroit, uh, I think it was uh, five years ago, something like that. Statistics were coming out saying that the majority of adults who are in Detroit can't read, either are illiterate or can't read uh, at their level. And I'm like, well, that's because they just push people along. That girl that I was telling you was getting demoralized, they followed her until she graduated. And she wanted to go to college and she was on her path to go to college, but she had to, she had to do extra work to get prepared for college. Sure because she was so far behind, but she graduated. Congratulations. Right. You know, I've seen that even, even when I was younger, like, how did they graduate? 
<laughs> they barely came to school. My kids tell me all the time that there are kids in their classes. Like my two oldest are, I moved my two youngest into private school mm -hmm. because my son, they, both the kids had dealt with some activist teachers, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. um, I'm somewhat vocal, <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, my son had some situations in middle school. It was pretty violent there. Mm. Um, and he had a situation, and so Mark and I decided to pull them out. But my two oldest, my daughter graduated, my son's still in public school. Um, they'll say, you know, there are kids in class that can't read well. I mean, it's just, it's just really disappointing. And, and really, who loses out are the kids that can't read. But the truth of the matter is, is that I don't know that the government is that concerned about that. I feel like they want voters. The Biden administration wants voters. And they're going to get them however they need and can. Mm. And if people can't read or think for themselves, well, we'll just tell them what to think. And then they'll vote the way we want. And we'll give them a lot of free stuff. And we'll make them, we'll just fill the needs that they have. And unfortunately, what we've forgotten, especially in the public school system, is, is that kids get a lot of confidence from mastery, from learning things, from being successful, right? From building on that. And um, it's just really disappointing when we see that the schools aren't focused on helping the kids, like really unfolding their full potential. You know, I, I think someone like Biden and, and, and long, long standing politicians honestly don't think they're that forward thinking. I think they're much more reactionary. Maybe. And they like to cover their tracks or they like to pretend that everything is good, especially if they're the ones who are in power. And I think they've, they're perfectly fine with sacrificing our children in order to not be criticized. They're perfectly fine with remixing failure as being success. Mm -hmm. Or don't look at that, look at this. Mm -hmm. um, and something as fundamental as reading is something that they can ignore. Why? Because it's not their kids. Right. Right? Their kids go to private schools and get the best education. That's Corey DeAngelis. I mean, he shows all the time on Twitter. It's like <laughs> every, every time some every time. <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> politician comes out and against school choice, he's like, your kids go to private school. It's like without fail now. Right. Every single time. The, the uh, media commentators who criticize school choice advocates, they say, you, you put your kids into private school. Well, well, you know, I pay for it. Oh, well... Isn't that nice for Isn't that you? Not, yeah. Isn't that nice for you? And then when our moms will um, pull their kids out of school, or like I have two in private, I've had two in public, I had all four in public for the whole time I was on school board. Mm -hmm. And then we pull our kids out because we're recognizing that harm's coming to them. And then they say, well, we don't, we're not allowed to have a voice in public education. And it's just to me like, it's just ridiculous. You should be able to safeguard your kids. You should be able and still, and you can still acknowledge what's happening, right? A lot of our moms are homeschooling now, but they're still working in the public school system because that's where they want their kids to be. Right. That's where their kids were. And they're not going to abandon the public school system because when you go into school as a mom and you volunteer, you're oftentimes not working with your own kid. A lot of the time when you go into the classroom, you're working with somebody else's kid, right? You're doing remediation. You're doing, you know, you're, you're working with them on reading fluency or you're helping them with math. And um, that's just the way that moms are, right? And we know that all of our kids are going to end up living life together mm -hmm. and they're going to need to be able to work with other people, to marry other people, to have children in a full life and, a, and hopefully a free country. And I think every day it seems like we're just taking steps towards you know, in a literate society, there's no future in America no. uh, in that. And, and, and people who aren't really thinking for themselves, it's scary. I mean, I, I just, I worry about the status quo just remaining the status quo. Um, and especially, we almost have like a complacency, to be honest with you, with the status quo, that certain kids in certain areas... This is all they have, and that's how it always should be, and there will always be failure, um, and no one really cares. I mean, that's honestly, that's why I pulled my son out of school, and we started doing homeschooling, is because he's going to a school where, and I've had conversations with the principal a couple times because of certain things, like, uh, you know, a feminist teacher tried to show him certain things, and I was like, mm, I'm not sure about that. And then I, you know, I had to have a conversation with the principal and we kind of smoothed things over. But the print, at least I will say this, at least the principal was like, you're not the only parent to contact me. Good. 
And so that means that next, next time we have a curriculum, we need to take that into consideration because we're error inside of caution. We don't want to upset parents. Yeah. I'm like, perfectly fine. I understand that. Um, but outside of that, his school was a failure. Yeah. Like his school, talking about status quo. When I was in high school, I went to the high school in the neighboring town that he was going to high school. That school was terrible then. Yeah. It was, I, I used to work in that town, right? So I, I worked with kids who went to that high school and I would hear the stories, like fights all the time. Oh yeah. I, Americans it, are not seeing a fraction. Amer you know, you go on Twitter, you see fights, you see a few kid fights with, between kids. That is, they, we are not seeing a fraction of a percent of the violence that we have occurring in our public schools every day across this country. And you, you know, I know there's an argument from people to say, like, don't show the fights. But then in some ways, I feel like America needs to see it. Mm -hmm. I feel like America needs to really see the reality of what's happening. I remember hearing a story in Chicago about <clears throat> a mom who was walking across the street with her daughter to go to Subway. And her daughter was eight. And her daughter got shot in the head by a stray bullet. This is Chicago, right? They've got crazy gun, law gun laws. People are still shooting each other. Right. And... I just thought to myself, like I really did in that moment, I was like, I could see this mom in the middle of the street with her daughter who's just been shot in the head. Can you imagine? No. And I just thought America needs to see this mom with her daughter in her lap dying because maybe that would like wake people up. Maybe we would see that like our kids are suffering because of all of this adult nonsense and we have the power to stop it as adults if we just decide to put our kids first. Right. But, you know, with the fights in school, people don't, you know, I remember there was a fight on a bus and people were like, don't show it, don't. I was like, show it all, maybe. Maybe that's what needs to happen. Maybe people will wake up when they see how bad it really is. But we have an education system, as I told you, that protects itself. Right. And so I'm sure you've seen, they don't want anything to come out. And I'll be honest with you, even when I was on school board, Tina and I have talked about this. I've shared this before. There would be like situations that would come up on the, in the district where parents would come to the podium and they'd be really upset about something that had happened with a teacher, with a situation at a school, their child had been harmed in some way, mm -hmm. right? Their child was being harmed. And your instinct as a school board member in that moment is to handle that situation. You have a parent in crisis, a kid that's being harmed, you know, you're uh, an elected official, you want your superintendent and staff to be attentive to that parent and you want to solve the problem. But sometimes when you allow it to happen, in a way that the superintendent and the school district want to allow it to happen, you know, they hand, they may handle that one situation. The truth is they're not the only parent dealing with that. Right. We've seen that. Right. And so if I had one regret from my time on school board, it would be that I sometimes would allow the situation to get handled, but I don't think I really looked at the problem and how systemic the problems were, right. That they were happening in other places or that it needed to be addressed in a broader way. And I think now American parents, because we're, you know, I mean, the age of information, good or bad, take it for what you want it to be, <laughs> right? Right. But we're talking to each other and we're like, oh my gosh, so you're in New Jersey, I'm in Florida, you're in California, you're in Oregon, you're in Michigan, you're in Texas, you're in Rhode Island. Same story. Right. Right. And so now we're seeing that so much of this is happening everywhere. And then you have to ask yourself, why is that? Right. Um, and, and, you know, our moms are good detectives. They're finding out why that is. Well, I mean, I think there's, so I'm like the, I've, I've joked and said like how Ibram X Please Kendi. Please try some if you'd like. It's really good. I'll try, I'll try <laughs> Please one. Please do. It is really good. Um, how Ibram X Kendi says, uh, it's not a matter of if there was racism involved, but where. Right. <laughs> um, for me, it's not if family dysfunction is involved, it's where it's causing a problem in our society. And I think much of, okay, you're saying you talk to these parents from different parts of the country and they all have similar stories, uh, all have similar levels of violence and, and dysfunction within the schools. Well, our kids are a reflection of our home. They are, but school systems have really looked to cut parents out too, Adam. Yeah. I mean, they really have, you know, they, they really do want this to just be too complicated and we're the experts and just listen to us and we'll handle it. And you know, the time for that is over. 
there is failure across the board. And so this idea that there's some expert that knows better for us than our children, I think I told you the Clark County School District uh, superintendent in Nevada, mm-hmm. if it's like one of the it's one of the largest districts in the nation. It's it's actually one of the districts that's failing the most. If Nevada was put on a chart of uh, and 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 even if District of Columbia was a state, Nevada would be fifty first. Mm-hmm. Just think about that for a second. And he signed some uh, pledge saying that you know educators know better than parents. Really? I mean, the audacity of that, the hubris, like. Really, you're failing these children. Parents are trusting you. They're sending their kids to school every day. It, I think it's betrayal. I really do. And, and I think at the very least, parents should expect their children to learn to read in school. <laughs> that sounds really. very basic, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a fair expectation. Right. This year in 2023, America will spend over $850 billion in local, state, federal funding in ed- public education. Right. At least, just if you do nothing else, nothing else teach the kids to read that alone would give them the opportunity to learn on their own but they can't they're not doing that they're focused on what gender ideology yeah right sel crt dei you know there's there's so many excuses for educational failure if only we did this and the bottom line is just teach the kids to read right we can all agree that we want the kids to learn to read we may disagree about what we want them to read i'm still waiting for someone to tell me what the right age is for you know to teach kids or have kids read about strap-on dildos in public school. <laughs> Nobody's like willing to be specific about that, right? Yeah. But teach the kids to read. Yeah. And I, I could just hear someone saying, well, that was just one book. You know, it's like, yeah. it should be zero books. Okay. If, you know what? Here's the deal on the books. If you can't show it on the news, yeah. if you have to blur it out on the news, don't have it in the public school. People say, what kinds of books? I don't know. Not those, though. If I can't go on Cuomo or if I can't go on CBS Sunday morning, if I can't do an interview and I can't read the passages for you on on TV, if I can't show the pictures on TV, you have to blur it out or only show the cover, then not those books. Why are so many people fighting so hard to put books into schools with explicit sexual content? That's really the question. So I have an answer that's kind of two-part. Great. So the first part is the real simple part. Some of them are perverts. Okay, well, that's probably true. <laughs> some of them are perverts. Okay. Now, the, the second part is that some people are so used to fighting against something that they'll end up fighting for something that is depraved. So Moms for Liberty is the bad guy. So we're going to fight against anything that they're, I'm sorry, we're going to fight for something that you're against. Anything against anything. anything. And Doesn't they're not even, even going to be, they're not even willing to stop and take a look at, and then have a conversation about they'll, it. They'll rationalize anything. And this isn't a left versus right thing. This is, human beings do this all the time. If they feel that their side or their group or whatever it is, is under attack, right? And if you're a progressive teacher, you feel that progressivism is under attack, or you feel that your ideology is under attack. They will hunker down and defend it to the death, even if it's highly illogical and makes no sense. I've seen this, all different types of examples, inside politics, outside politics. But that's when you get these teachers, when you do actually have a dialogue with them, you see them like scrambling to find rationality as to why there's dildos in a school, (laughs) in a book. They're like, well, you know, uh, it's just one book. They, they, right. They're reaching. They're yeah. really reaching for something because they can't, they can't admit that they're wrong and that their group might be wrong about something. Right. And, and I think that that's the crux of it. And what ends up happening is they cover for the perverts that exist within school systems, which, by the way, perverts exist everywhere. Sure. And perverts have existed in schools when I was a kid, too. Yeah. Right? No and, doubt. So, I mean, but now this is, this is a new um, smiley face on perversion, right? We're, th- no, this is to help the kids so they're comfortable with their bodies, you know. Right. They say things like that. And, but anybody with common sense would be like, no, that sounds... I think that's such an interesting yeah. point because people online, like on Twitter, people will come back when I'll we'll post something. I don't really post a lot about teachers um, sexualizing children or if there's a news report or something you know, we'll share it. But my focus isn't on, like, I don't think, like, I don't think that teachers are, 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 
I don't think there are more teachers that are sexually assaulting kids than other people who are coming into contact with kids. To your yeah. point, I think just there are perverts who uh, sexualize children. Um, I think that, you know, because you're dealing with children in schools, you have a higher propensity of the situation happening because you're having that engagement, right? Well, and predators um, go where the prey is. Right. And and so people will post things like, well, what about these pastors or these Republicans? <laughs> and I'm always like, yeah, all sexual predators are bad. Right. Like, how many times do I need to say this? Do you think I'm giving priests a pass? Like, no one's giving <laughs> anyone who's sexually molesting a child a pass because they they say they're religious or they say that they're an educator or they, no one gets a pass when it comes to kids. Right. Like we're against all for the record <laughs> moms for Liberty against all the sexual predators hurting kids. Just put that noted. noted. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you even have to say that though, and that's the point. It's like our society treats adults like children and children like adults. Right. That's the way it feels. Right? We're rushing children through childhood and then we have to have safe spaces and safe words for adults. <laughs> and it's such a, it, it, you know, that in itself is such a perversion. Right. And it's hurting us. And it's hurting our kids because children are, it, it's such a fleeting time in your life. And they do not have the ability to be able to handle things that adults are able to handle. I mean, it takes a long time. Even, you know, for men, they say that men, even coming into their 20s, right, your, your rational mind, your ability to reason, it's different than women. And so this idea that somehow children are able to handle all of these adult concepts and they mm -hmm. should be introduced to all of this, it's to the detriment of kids. And I think parents of all different uh, walks of life are really just blowing the whistle and saying, enough. We are done with this nonsense. No one's going to tell us what's best for our child. We are the parent. We know what's best for our child. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that in public schools we think, you know, we think we should be dictating every single thing. We'll work with teachers and with school districts as partners, yes. right? But, you know, the idea that somehow parents, you know, your kids are somebody else's kids when they walk into that classroom, that your parental rights stop at the classroom door. No, we reject that wholeheartedly. And there's no compromise to be had there. And I think that's what we've talked about, right? Like the, the dialectic, this idea of the pendulum swinging so far back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. And so on one side you have, you know, drag queens in the kindergarten classroom. That's an intentional provocation. The drag queens have, nobody had a problem with drag queens before they were, you know, there was a white paper by Lil Miss Hot Mess saying, talking about drag queen pedagogy mm -hmm. and leaving glitter in the carpet. That's literally what it says. We are, it is an indoctrination point for queer theory, drag queens in the schools. Right. And it is, uh, we, they're going to leave glitter in the carpet, meaning leaving a lasting mark, changing the way that teaching is going in schools, right? It's this activist teaching. Um, James Lindsay talks a lot about Ferrer, Paula Ferrari and this idea of generative themes being introduced in the classroom, that the function of education isn't, um, functional literacy, but it's political literacy, right? right? It's the awakening of a critical consciousness in the child. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing happen in the schools. And parents can't always talk about it in the way, I mean, it's taken me a long time to be able to understand and talk about it in the way that I am. But the way that I would explain it is you've got drag queens in the classroom. So when the pendulum goes that far, are we willing to like come to a new compromise for the middle, right? Well, maybe these books aren't that bad because having a drag queen in the classroom sitting on the carpet, you know, some man is a character as a woman reading a book about, you know, today you can be a girl, tomorrow you can be a boy, you know, the next day you could be a boy and a girl or a tree maybe, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, now you're willing to compromise on like a new normal. Right. But the problem with queer theory is as soon as you compromise on a new normal, the dialectic starts again. And so now there's going to be conflict. Now the pendulum's going to shift again, and then we're going to have to, you know, compromise again. And then we keep moving in this direction and uh, parents, again, they may not be able to articulate it, but I talk to parents all over the country. Uh, they feel it. They know. There's a lot of stuff happening. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, people ask me all the time, how did we get here? Right. And again, as I said, it's a slow boil. It's happened over time. And they continue to move us farther and farther away. And, and now you have, you know, like moms and moms for liberty saying no. And we're not going to compromise on this book. We're going to tell you that these are our children and we don't want them sexualized. And we're going to push you back to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's just what we're in the process of. And it's uncomfortable for some people like Gavin Newsom who, you know, want money and votes 
and uh, are willing to sell out to whoever is willing to give him money and votes. Um, but I think what these politicians are about to see is that the, the tide is turning and America is waking up and American parents are tired of being told someone knows better than us for our kids and we're going to stand up and fight. Yeah. When, um, when did you start, or I, it wasn't just you. It but, wasn't just me. Um, when did Moms for Liberty start? I've, yeah. I'm so, trying to remember that. Um, Tina and I both served on school boards from 2016 to 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really know each other. We weren't friends. I mean, we didn't. We were in neighboring districts, but during COVID, we both were the ones who were on the bottom side of four-one votes when it came to forced masking and quarantining and talking about, you know, as far as we you know what role parents should play. We were really fighting for parental rights, um, and we noticed that about each other. And then our terms ended in November of 2020. Uh, and Tina came to me and said, um, we need to do something. We have to help these parents to be effective advocates. She tells a story, which always really resonates with me, where parents came to her when she was on school board and they said, um, they were upset with the whole school board, not just her. Mm -hmm. And they weren't really upset with her, actually. They probably loved her. And they said uh, to the other school board members, we're going to report you to the county commission. And Tina said she remembers sitting there and thinking to herself, um, the county commission has nothing to do with the school board. But they didn't know that, right? They had no idea. And so that was really the, the moment when I think her light bulb went off in her head. That was like, you know, if we're actually going to get anywhere in this country, we're going to have to help these parents to know how, how to navigate, how to move forward, what, right. what they need to do, who they need to talk to, where the authority lies. And that's what I was seeing uh, it, it, during COVID was parents really wanted to understand like, okay, these policies are hurting my kids. Who is in charge of putting these policies in place? Is it my school board? Is it my county commissioner? Is it my state house rep or my state senate rep? Is it the governor? Is it the AG? Is it Congress? Is it the president? Like we wanted to know, right? And so now Moms for Liberty empowers moms to know. Right. And one of our values is to build relationships. And so when you talk to our moms now, they they have the cell phone numbers of their state house reps, their state senate reps. Sometimes there are congressional members. Tina and I will go places around the country. Uh, I think we were at CPAC actually, and somebody came up to us and they were like, oh, my mom in my district. And it, they were talking about their mom's for Liberty mom mm -hmm. and their chapter chair, but it was their mom. They, you know, they, I think what we realized was is that the people that are trying to make the change happen in politics needed us as much as we needed them. And it was just really, you know, they need an army. Even on school board, I knew I couldn't do anything alone. Even if I didn't have a consensus in the moment, if I was able to build an army to help me, I could change the way the board voted. And the union has known that for a long time, right? right. And so, so one of the reporters said to me recently something about like, oh, you know, the union or people say you're, you're injecting politics into the classroom. And uh, my answer back to that is politics have been involved in education <laughs> for a very long time. Yeah. I just don't think our politics, our, our feelings about, you know, individualism and about liberty, um, about, you know, a lot of things that we stand for uh, were there. And so now we're showing up and we're speaking out and that looks messy. It looks like conflict because they don't want to have to change and they like being in power. Why wouldn't they? Right. right? Uh, there's a lot of money. In education, as we've said, a lot of people make a lot of money off of our kids' education. Um, and so, you know, they're uncomfortable right now, and, and I'm okay with them being uncomfortable. <laughs> Me too. Um, no, the reason I, I was also asking when you guys started, yeah. one, I couldn't 20, remember. January of 2021. 2020. Two chapters. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds like you guys got together because of 2020. Yeah, I mean, we saw behind the education curtain when we were on school board. I know I say that all the time. It's just true. You, you, we have this unique perspective of being parents mm -hmm. and being on the school board. So you get to like, you make the policy and then your kids are coming home. I, I used to say I unpack a lot of backpacks right. when I was running for school board. And then you get to see what does the policy look like as it's implemented, the procedure, which is what the superintendent and district staff are responsible for. And you see very clearly if the, the way that the board is voting, if the will of the board is actually happening in the schools. And when you're a parent and you have friends, you know, your kid goes to one high school, my kid goes to another high school, you know what's happening with school board. And you're like, well, you know, I know you guys voted on this, but that's not the way it's happening here. It's not just hearing complaints at the supermarket or the grocery store. I mean, the you know, grocery store or church or whatever, where, you know, 
you're actually seeing it and you know the people that are telling you this stuff. And I know Adam's not a liar. He's not looking to cause a problem, but he's really concerned that all of a sudden his son is being split into a different group of kids. And now they're having, you know, segregated, uh, you know, classes or segregated, uh, you know, um, meetings about college Mm -hmm. or about like, why is that happening? And so when you talk about progressive, what always feels to me is that all of this stuff feels really regressive. Right. Everything's based on a stereotype. We're going back to segregating kids and talking about identities and about the difference of us and our color of our skin and how that makes us different. And I felt like, I mean, I think all of, I think really most of the people in our generation, honestly, are kind of like, well, we, we, we grew up together. Right. We were never looking to be divided. We were looking, we, I just... Honestly, I think a lot of Americans, and and I have said this, I went on Dr. Phil about CRT and he asked me um, that you get to ask him one question. And uh, so my one question was, what is it, what does CRT do to biracial kids? Because we have a lot of kids that come from homes where they have a black mother and a white father or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And what does telling a child that half of them is good and half of them is bad do to that child, you know, emotionally, psychologically, what does it do to the family unit? Yeah. And, uh, you know, he didn't answer the question, but <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess it's not great. Right. Right. Um, you know, I, I just, you remember the, before 2020, like, I think it was like after the year 2000, you would see like these TV specials and these, um, it wasn't there a movie called 2020. I don't know. I, I don't watch remember. that movie, so I'm the wrong person. But I remember like 2020 being like this mythical year, like something significant was going to happen. Yeah, all the computers were going to break, right? Because it ended in zero. Oh, 2020? Oh, that was, 20, that, that was, was 2000. 2000. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, all the, everything was going to stop because of 2000, right? But 2020 zero, is, zero. is a is an interesting year, especially now that we're three years past. Um, and I've, I kind of came to like naming it the year of rebirth where a lot of people were born again, not to take it from Christianity, but kind of like born again into different people because of something significantly, um, some sort of significant shift has happened, forcing them to um, do something different, do something different. To question. Yeah, question themselves, um, move away from their old self and become their new self, being born again and and fighting uh, for something different or even just believing in something. Different. I saw it like with, Co- I mean, like Jennifer Say, Daniel Kotzen, two friends from San Francisco who mm-hmm. moved to Colorado. Um, I remember following Daniel and I mean, that was a huge, I mean, I think there were just people who woke up and said, wait a second, like the people that are representing us where we're living, they're making horrible choices for our families. Yeah. So, and then that was, a. I mean, they've been lifelong Democrats who, you know, if you talk to Daniel now, he'll tell you he'll never vote for a Democrat again. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm a product of that. I wouldn't be sitting here with you if it wasn't for all the things that were happening in 2020, especially George Floyd. Um, and I think that whatever, was it uh, every action, you know, there's a reaction equal, to it. Yep. Equal, equal, equal and opposite reaction. Yep. And I think that you represent that with Moms for Liberty, especially. Uh, I represent that. I think a lot of people represent that. A lot of the moms that are part of your organization yep. represent that. They weren't political figures. They, you know, <laughs> no. They could care less. Yeah. Um, but they were forced into becoming something that was different. And I think ultimately um, we were talking about support. It's scary doing it at first because you think that you're on an island yep. by yourself. But then you realize that, no, there's a ton of people who are out here with me and a ton of people who are willing to support me. And actually, the people who are on an island are the people that you're fighting against. Yeah. And I think that is a message that um, more people need to kind of understand that that fight isn't you don't have to be alone in that fight. And regular people can do extraordinary things. So I think regular people yeah. do extraordinary things for their kids. I mean, parents will do anything for their children. You die for your child. You know, I mean, that, that's the thing. You know, the idea that 
You're going to send your kid to school and some counselor is going to have a private conversation about your child, about their gender identity, and they're going to keep secrets from you. And then the school system or the government's going to think, well, that you're a danger to your child. I always think about, you know, I have a daughter who is um, in college and if she had gotten pregnant in high school, Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and she had been at school and she was scared to tell me because she probably would have been scared to tell me because she knows what she would probably say to them is, oh my gosh, my mom is going to kill me. Like, am I going to kill her? No, no healthy, sane parent is going to kill their child. Right. Would I be disappointed in the decisions that she had made? Yeah. But being a mom is a, is a big responsibility. It's 16, 17, 18, the ideal time to have a baby when you have plans to go to college and to go work and, you know, to live a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's hard. It's going to be harder. You're going to have to make different decisions. Abortion wouldn't be an option in our house, right? She'd be having the baby, right? right? But the idea that, you know, a kid could go into school and say, my mom's going to kill me if she finds out I'm pregnant and now informed consent is 12 years old in your state and the school could go take her to get an abortion without me knowing about it. I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, that's a real thing. And that's crazy. And Planned Parenthood is right there, right? Here's the, here's the um, morning after pill, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they'll give that to kids. They have stickers in bathrooms all across America in the bathrooms in public schools, you know, celebrating the morning after pill. Mm. Um, so, and, 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 and talking about how it's accessible to kids. And Planned Parenthood, the federal government wants to do something called community schools where they give grants for community partners to come in to give supports to kids, and, and the thing I'll say back to that is, you're not teaching our kids to read. Why am I going to trust you to do anything else with my child <laughs> if you're failing at the very basic level of what our expectations are for you right. as, as an institution? And so, um, you know, it, it, I think it is a reckoning time. I think a lot of parents have woken up. Um, our moms have not been political. I was never political. I mean, I liked uh, I, I always paid attention to debates. I always voted. I was always involved, you know, at presidential level. I don't think I knew my local politics. I know I didn't know my local politics the way I needed to. Even when I was before I ran for school board, I didn't always pay attention as much as I should have. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think COVID woke people up. And I say all the time, Allie Beth Stuckey at our summit, our first summit in Philadelphia, when she spoke said, politics matter because policies matter because people matter. And I think there's a real effort to shame moms, women, and say like, oh, you're becoming political, you're getting involved in politics. We didn't know we needed to. Honestly, I think moms were really busy living their lives and taking care of their families, right? Having a kid and working, it's a really busy time in your life. Right. And we, I don't, just don't think we realized that we had to get involved and have our voices heard because this government does not work well without us. We are, we the people are the government, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're not running for office, if you're not serving in office, somebody else is. Right. And are your values being reflected in your community? And I think during COVID, a lot of people said, whoa, I don't care what letter you have after your name. Right. You're making decisions that are really bad for my family. And now we're going to have to figure out how to affect that. And so, you know, I I think that there's a real effort to try to paint Moms for Liberty as uh, different things. But the truth is, and you've met a lot of our moms, um, they just... They just weren't largely political people who are now more involved. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've met enough, and I, I was glad to write that Newsweek article. Thank you. That was a wonderful article. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming to the summit. No, it was my pleasure. Um, and it, it and was, speaking, you, had, you did a breakout session. Yeah. 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 And, and I ran into people who came to the year before, and they said, Thank you for that one. You yeah. Know, that really helped. I took the notes that you made. Um, so, I mean... All that's great. Um, I will say this: my Newsweek article really pissed off a bunch of leftists. No doubt. <laughs> and that was that was actually kind of funny. Um, my favorite line was, "I don't know who Adam Coleman is, but I hate him." <laughs> <laughs> I, I like, think that thing is perfect. I think that's the perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. I don't know who Adam Coleman is, but I hate him. I mean, how can you hate someone who you don't even know, who you've never had a conversation with? Yeah. It's great. It's yeah. very representative of where we are. Yeah. The, <laughs> but I, I, think it was, <clears throat> I, I think it was important for me to write that because I go back to my wife. My wife isn't political, but she's there to support me. 
But she does, She wants no part of this stuff. Yeah. But she was there. She was there at the yes, conference. Yes, she was. It was so nice to, to meet her. Yeah, you know, to, to support me. But she got to see what we go through. But she, she saw it from a very innocent place because she saw how inside... I will tell you this, by the way. Yeah. Moms for Liberty is the best conference oh, that good. I've been to. <laughs> That's awesome. Because you guys have a purpose. You have strategies. You have... You, you do have some speeches, yeah. right? But you make people feel like they can actually do something because they can, yeah. right? And I've been to other conferences where it's just pep rallies. They're just saying the same yammering stuff. But it, it really is a positive environment. Good. And then my wife walks outside and people are screaming and vitriolic and throwing stuff. Screaming at a building, as James it's, Lizzie would screaming say. Screaming at a building. Yeah. But it, it, it's this weird situation because these people, People clearly have no idea. Like they, they think that we're inside with pitchforks ready to, you know, how do we hurt disenfranchised people? <laughs> we're, and, and, and it's the complete opposite. So she got to, to, see, to see that. And I, what I wanted to do with that article was show people exactly what my wife saw, that these are just moms. Yep. Like, I'm a pretty good judge of character. And I was like, all these people really care about where they're from. And everyone would tell me the same story, 2020. They put masks on my kid. Everybody thinks like, oh, they're doing this because they watch Fox News. I was like, no, you don't listen to these people. They put masks on their small children. Yep. And they said that you crossed a line. Yep. And they did something about it. So I think it was, it was important because there's not enough honest media representation about your organization. And I just thought it was a fair thing, especially you as a, as a person, you know, I've gotten Thank to you. know you. You and Tina have been great. Some of the nicest people. Thank and you. And I've been around people and some of them are like sort of, you know, a little shady or a little bit weird. He's like, you guys have been just like regular people. And I like that. Thank you. We opened that conference up to all media. I mean, you saw, I think yeah. there were 130 different media outlets there. Um, you know, Media Matters decided to come and they didn't buy, t they, they didn't announce themselves as media. They bought tickets, uh, which is fun. I mean, it, it, I've been told it's unethical as a journalist, but I don't care. <laughs> I mean, we have nothing to hide. That's the point. Right. And they came and they really struggled to like find anything nasty to say about anyone. Cause I would imagine they were sitting at tables with moms who were like so happy to meet each other and, mm -hmm. or see each other again. Or enjoy, you know, I think one of the things that they said was that the food was too nice that was or too best. good. Yeah. <laughs> and the truth is that I think you and I have been to a lot of different conferences where the food sometimes isn't very healthy or mm -hmm. you don't feel really good. And we know when moms come to that summit, it's hard as a mom to get away for three days like that, especially in the summer, right? Your kids right. are home. And we want moms to really walk away from that feeling inspired, feeling um, healthy and, and feeling, you know, really excited about the future and making change happen. And, it, it, you know, that's, that's really what happens. People come to the conference and, and they'll say like, you know, I had people coming up to me at this summit and they said, when I came last year, it changed my life. Mm. Like I was, and you said, you know, people <clears throat> say like, they're not sleeping. If people say to me like, oh my gosh, I'm so worried. I don't know what to do. I'm not sleeping. I sleep. Like we sleep, we're working so hard every day and we're filled with such purpose and we know exactly what we're trying to do, right? Which is to defend parental rights, to unify parents, educate them on the issues, right? So they feel empowered to make change happen in whatever way that is. Not everybody's going to run for office, it's not for everybody, right. but maybe your friend is running. Maybe you can help them. Maybe you can write op-eds, right? Maybe you can do citizen journalism, which is so powerful, which is what you spoke about, right? Mm -hmm. How do you tell your story? You know, if, if someone's not willing to tell your story, how are you going to tell it? Right. Um, and so everybody has a role to play. And it's really just finding what gifts you have inside yourself right now that you can work together to save the country. Yeah. And um, that's what we try to do at the summit. Uh, I think that having all the presidential candidates there was awesome because it just really showed the moms that they were united on the issue uh, the, of parental rights that we're concerned about, about gender ideology in the schools, which has no business being there. And we've got moms who support all different presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, we make space for that because all of those presidential candidates were with us when it came to the issues that we really care about. And then no matter who wins, we're winning. Right. Right. Kids are winning. So, yeah. um, you know, we tried to, it, it's just awesome to be able to create that. And Tina and I, it's just an honor. I think we look at each other all the time and we're just like, 
all the moms are so smart and dads and, and members, and they really care about our country. And it's just an honor to be a part of it. That's awesome. Um, well, before we end, I want yeah, to... Yeah, well, you ha- we have like banana tempura. Oh, that's right. Don't forget. forget. And I think there's ice cream. It might be a little melted. Oh, I don't know. You I can't, you can't, yeah, that. yeah, you're not an ice cream guy, but we can have this. Ice cream I'm weird on. Like right. it, it, some, sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm not. Well, there's ice cream here if you want it, but there's bananas too, so I go will, for it if you want. I will I've risk. never had banana tempura before. Then you have to, you have I'll to try do the first I'll one. I'll do the first one to try it. <laughs> okay, let me try it. I, I like bananas cannot. and I like chocolate, so that, it sounds like a good mix. Yeah. Survey says? Oh, it's delicious. It'd probably okay. be better when it was like hot, hot, but yeah. it's still delicious. I mean, it's bananas and chocolate, Adam. <laughs> you can't, can't go, go wrong. wrong. Seriously. You really can't go wrong. I interrupted you in your last question. No, it's okay. <laughs> this is worth the interruption. Oh, good. So I guess my last question is, are you optimistic? Yes, I'm very optimistic. Very optimistic. Uh, we're learning. We're not taking the bait anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of things are laid out before us, and they uh, their target is our reaction. Mm-hmm. And I think that American parents are wise to the fact that there are intentional provocations, and they're looking for us to react in a certain way. And when we react in the way they want, then they use that to try to hurt us. And we're smarter now. We're getting smart. That's why I love James Lindsay so much. James comes to the summit And he speaks, but he also talks to our moms. He's on our advisory board. He helps us to strategize, to understand what's the intention and how do you really handle it. Um, We've got a lot of friends who help us to do that. And so um, I am really optimistic because nobody's going to fight for anything like a mom or a dad is going to fight for their kid. Right. And we we could disagree on a lot of different stuff. But if we can come together about safeguarding children, innocence, right, safeguarding the lives of children. Our country will be better for it. And I do think it's like a very unique unifier. I think in this moment right now, when there's so much division and the division is being used, the cultural Marxism, right? We know that's what's happening. I, you know, I didn't get into this a lot, but I do believe that we're in the middle of a cultural revolution mm-hmm. in this country. I think the schools are being used um, as an indoctrination point and that the kids are being trained to... Uh, go against the parents, much like Mal did with the Red Guard. Mm -hmm. You know, we see that history repeating itself. It's not so crazy to think that happens. We've seen it happen many times in the past. Right. Um, And, uh, but we're smarter than that now. We're on to them. And there are a lot more of us than there are of them. Exactly. And the truth is on our side. (laughs) There are men and there are women. And there's a small percentage of people who deal with intersex syndromes and issues. We need to be compassionate and kind. But there's no such thing as a man becoming a woman or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what a woman is. It's an adult human female. Men can't get pregnant, right? We have all these truths that we just know, right? right? And so people are kind of coming back to this common sense and awakening, right? We were told there was an expert class who might know better than us. COVID showed us that's a lie. Mm -hmm. When the American Academy of Pediatrics tells moms, oh, your baby doesn't need to see your face. The mask isn't an issue. (laughs) Every parent knows. Yeah. Your ba- you have a baby in front of you. I was watching a video of a little baby the other day and the brother. Um, and they were like cooing at each other. The little brother was making like O oh sounds and the baby was doing it back and watching the mouth. And, you know, that's this. Right. This is humanity. This is, you know, we are meant to interact with each other and to see each other's faces and to look into each other's eyes. And, uh, I think COVID and and the way that it was handled was meant to do a number of different things. I think some of those things were uh, were accomplished by the people that wanted to use it as a lever of control, but I think some of the things backfired against them. Yeah. Uh, because humans want interaction with each other, we crave it, and uh, so yeah, I'm really optimistic because um, again, nobody's going to fight for anything like a parent's going to fight for their child. So our kids' future in this country, America, I really believe it depends on us. Thomas Paine said, if there must be trouble, let it come in my day so my children may live in peace. Mm. Um, We are raising the next group of patriots in this country. They're going to have a heck of a fight because they have a couple generations ahead of them, a couple, you know, 10 year spans, right? Where you've got kids who have been indoctrinated in schools and have bought it. 
but I think our kids aren't going to. Um, yeah. They see through it, right? We've inno- we're inoculating them against the nonsense. And uh, we just have to get them strong. And we have to ensure that our country is going to continue um, with our, our freedom and our liberty intact. And uh, we're doing, Tina and I and all the moms across the country um, are just amazing women. And we're doing everything we can. Yeah. No, you guys have been great. You're doing great. Thank um, you. And I like to answer... I'm optimistic. Are you, yes, may I ask you, are yes. you optimistic? Please. <laughs> um, I'm like painfully optimistic. Awesome. Um, I'm optimistic because someone like you and someone like me uh, did something that we weren't really supposed to do, that we didn't yeah. plan on doing because we felt we needed to do something. <clears throat> and I think that is a point of pride that a lot of us can, can hold. Like we are products of 2020. As crazy as 2020 was, it produced all different types of great things. It opened up our circle to amazing people. I, 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 I'm sure you've met a ton of amazing people. It's amazing. I've met a bunch of amazing people. Yeah, who knew we were going to make so many friends in our 40s? <laughs> Seriously. Exactly. Who knew? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, especially because, not because we just wanted a hobby, but in defense of the most innocent. Yes. All right. Or, yeah, or, I didn't. <laughs> moms don't. Moms did not need a hobby. They're either, and that's, and really, that's it. You know, there are a million places that a mom would rather be than you know standing at a podium having to read pornographic material to right. you know to a school board. But if that's what we need to do in order to move this country forward to show the truth, then that's what we're going to do. And you know, hopefully, in the future, there will be better days ahead when uh, we'll be able to not have to be uh, so worried all the time about. Uh, the innocence and the future of our kids. But for right now, the fight is here and it's upon us and we're just going to do what we need to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Well, thank you again for Uh, inviting me in your home and having a meal with me and having this dialogue. So thank you. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks.